Good afternoon. My name is Autumn McDonald, and I am the head of New America California. Thank you for tuning into this webinar, Latinx Economic Resilience in the Time of COVID. This is our eighth online conversation since mid-April. Uh, others have focused on COVID in the Black community, small business supports, and reimagining work in the workforce. New America is a think and action take based out of Washington, D.C. New America California's efforts focus on issues of economic equity, community voice and agency, as well as how those with lived experiences can drive policy and systems change. I'm incredibly grateful to our speakers for being with us today. I'm also particularly uh, grateful to our moderators, Cecilia Munoz and Lily uh, Genghis. Lily, a huge thank you to you and to Cape, the Cape Horse Center for your partnership and for co-leading this conversation. Cecilia, thank you to you as well, uh, so much for your amazing mentorship, uh, as well as your national leadership, and for agreeing to moderate not one, but two of these conversations. Uh, I'm really excited to be able to be here as a particip participant and listen and learn. Uh, and with that, I would love to pass it over to our incredible moderators. Thank you so much, Lily and Cecilia. Thank you so much, Autumn. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, Autumn, thanks to you for all the hard work in setting this up, and thanks to our participants and, and Lily Ann echoing. Autumn's thanks to you for, um, for hosting and for your partnership and for co-moderating with me. I have been looking forward to this because we have a really extraordinary group of, um, of panelists. So I'm just gonna introduce them briefly and then pass the microphone, as it were, across the country. Uh, to Lily. So we have with us Jacqueline Martinez Garcel, who is the CEO of the Latino Community Foundation, Irma Olguin, who is the co founder and CEO of Bitwise Industries, Jose Quinones, from the, who is a, also founded the Mission Asset Fund um, and is the CEO, and Amanda Renteria, who is the brand new. Uh, lead uh, CEO of Code for America, uh, which is an, a very, very important partner of New Americas. Um, I am kind of fangirling all over all of you. I'm very, very excited about this conversation. Uh, and let me kick it over to Lily to get us started. Over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Cecilia. And thank you so much to our panelists that are here. And thank you to you all who are joining us today across the US and maybe even global, who knows who's registered as well, um, specifically in these such important and crucial times. We are in the midst of a global pandemic and one of the largest social movements with Black Lives Matter. And so being able to have the time and space is really important for us. So thank you all um, for being here as well. On that note, I'm Lily Genghis, she, her pronouns. I serve as the Chief Technology Community Officer at the CAPER Center. And for those who may not know what the CAPER Center is, I'll do a quick brief and then we'll jump right in. Uh, the Keeper Center, we focus on making the tech ecosystem and entrepreneurship um, more diverse, inclusive, and impactful by boldly focusing on closing gaps of access via STEM education, investments, intersectional research partnerships, and advocacy. And more personally, as a Latina immigrant from Bolivia, proud Bolivian, uh, um, fostering community engagement in tech is super critical. I'm honored to be here with you all to raise awareness on the specific disproportional impact COVID is having in our communities of color, specifically the Latinx community. With more data being shared and increasing spread, it's definitely sobering. Just in California this week, we're anticipating over 100,000 cases being uh, diagnosed, and especially in an area that I call home, which is Oakland. Right in Fruit Belt, right in East Oakland, we're starting to see even more um, significant rise, according to some data from the SF Chronicle. And so these implications we know are also just beyond healthcare, and they're across the entire economic spectrum for an unforeseen time with a large subset of essential workers that are also Latinx. And so I wanted to set, the, set some of the context today because we know that there is a lot of ground to cover today. And as you can see from our panelists, we have an amazing cross-sector representation. And with some of the, the leaders in our community that are seeing some of these impacts and changes directly. So with that said, let's get started and let's move the dialogue into what are things that uh, we can do to move forward with resilience. But before we do that, I would love to start with Jacqueline. Um, and if you can please share your two minute story of how this whole movement in time, especially the impact COVID is having, how does that connect with where you're at personally right now? 
First of all, Lili and Cecilia, thank you for hosting the conversation. I know like Jose and Amanda and Irma, we've been on multiple calls and panels talking about this. Um, so it feels like we're on a revolving chair, just sitting down, talking, doing. Um, I'm also an immigrant uh, daughter of parents who immigrated from the Dominican Republic in the 1960s. Jose, I love your background because it's reminding me of home right now, a uh, place I'd rather be in at this moment. Um, Personally, for me, uh, I'm daughter of a Black Dominican father, I should say, and a white Dominican mother. So in this space right now uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement, I'm thankful that, uh, that the unity um, and the history that is shared between Blacks and Latinos in this country will move us to the right direction right now, counting on all of our young leaders who've been leading the movement um, and who have been uh, not just... Uh, organizing in the streets, but also organizing and run for office. And Amanda, grateful for your history in this space too, of making sure that our young people have um, the space to speak about an agenda that speaks to their, to their issues and their priorities. So I've been living in California for four years now, and I came here because Latinos make up a majority of the population, a plurality in the state, 39% of the population, and run an organization that exists to unleash the civic and economic power of Latinos because we've been the economic engine of our state and have yet to benefit from the prosperity that the, that the state actually boasts about. So like everyone on this panel have been working to invest in Latino leaders, Latino led organizations that are on the front lines of investing in our youth and our families and creating those opportunities to access capital, to access jobs, to create new jobs, to be the entrepreneurs that is in our DNA, but figuring out ways where we can invest in them and, 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 and elevate and amplify uh, the, the range of creativity and leadership that comes from being Latino in this country. Um, and so, you know, this has slowed us down in part because I've been personally impacted, um, had six family members in March 26 who were diagnosed, three died by April 19th. Uh, this morning spoke to some cousins in South Florida, two of them have gotten a positive result. And so while trying to navigate the professional, there's still this immediate impact that's hitting close to home and trying to navigate and take care of my own mental health because there are mornings that I wake up where I'm just trying to figure out where do I even get started? And that's just real for a lot of our leaders right now that are on the front lines. Thank you so much for sharing, um, Jacqueline. And, and I know that these are challenging times. And so thank you for, for being, um, for being for sharing so much of that, so definitely appreciate it. Irma, you're um, not too far from Oakland. How are yeah. you doing? How how is this specifically also impacting you personally? Um, what's the what's a two minute story there? Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, there's there's much more than two minutes, but I think what you're going to hear from each of the panelists is how personal this has become, right? Not just the not just the disproportionate impact of COVID on the Latino community, but also on our businesses and the way that we choose to live our lives, right? I think the, that each of us on, on the panel, we have dedicated um, ourselves to a life of service and that manifests its way in a, in a number of different ways. And I think that that's unique also to the Latinx community in, in the way that so many of the folks that you're seeing sort of come through in leadership do so from a place of service specifically to help to uh, lift up um, other folks in our, same, in our same communities. And so even though there's a, um, in addition to there being this disproportionate effect on our community life, I think there's also a disproportionate effect on our person, personal life, on our missional and spiritual lives. And then of course, as Jacqueline was saying, on our mental and emotional well, well-being as we watch our actual family members and our actual friends and you know, the folks who like serve us coffee and you know, those types of things in our daily lives become afflicted with all of the number of things that are going on. Um, so it's very, very close to home. Um, and I don't mean that in a, in a, a, hyper, a hyperbolic way. I mean, in like a very, you know, I can name names, you know, and I can tell their stories kind of way. It's not an abstract thing. And it's not just a matter of headlines that you see that are affecting someone else, someplace else in the country. Um, I think in addition to that, you know, um, as a, a member of the LGBTQ community and just coming off of you know, Pride Month and, and um, sort of celebrating that in a way that hasn't ever been experienced in this country, meaning there was no true celebration. And in many ways, 
sort of sharing this time with the Black Lives Matter movement, incredibly, incredibly important. Um, I think that what we're seeing is this sort of, um, uh, on a very personal level, you feel like it's never been more important to be you. Um, and, and in addition to that, it's never been more important to be you out loud. Uh, and that feels, you know, when I think about all of the different things that are happening in the world today, COVID and the recession and, and any number of things that we can list and talk about, it's super personal and it feels really, really important to do things like this panel uh, to make sure that what we're doing is very, very public um, and to sort of revisit the mission of all of the different ways that we spend our time. Definitely, definitely. And it's that lived journey that I think provides us that even extra fire under us, right, to, to represent for our communities as well. And so thank you so much for sharing that. Amanda, I'm going to go next to you, um, see how you're doing. Well, how are you personally experiencing this moment? Yeah, um, first of all, I just want to say thank you um, for inviting me on this call with um, so many leaders on the phone, um, not just in the state, but who are national leaders really um, changing the discussion um, to really bring in the Latinx voice. And so it's really honored to be with you. Um, so, you know, for me, my story begins in the Central Valley, and I look everything through that lens, have throughout my entire life. Um, my parents were former farm workers, um, and I grew up in the lowest income congressional district in this state, among the 10th lowest income across the country. And as I look about, as I look at what we are going through as a country, I have to say, um, having spent most of my life in public service, um, both on the policy and politics side, you know, our communities have been going through a lot for a long time. And now add in COVID and now add in essential workers and now add in economic instability and what we are embarking on political instability as well. And for me, um, what has been something I've thought a lot about um, over the course of time is how invisible um, some of our communities are, some of our gente is, and right now we need to see them more than ever. Um, I just started a CEO role at Code for America and in part, I did it for three different reasons. Number one, I still believe government is the place that we can make change at scale. Number two, I think technology um, can be that magic bridge so that it serves everyone. And number three, if we're gonna recreate this government right now, which we have an opportunity to do, um, we've gotta do it with a, with a much broader lens. And I'm proud to be part of an organization that for the last 10 years have really been serving and seeing the kind of communities that I grew up in. Um, and I know we're gonna talk more about this, but uh, I just wanna tell this story here because I don't often get a chance to tell it, but the day, my first day of starting this job of Code for America was the first day that we launched the Disaster Relief Assistance Act for immigrants. And Code for America sat right next to the state of California to do that. And it will forever have shaped this chapter of my life because I believe that we as a tech world, we as public servants need to make sure that we are seeing all of our communities, especially in this moment. So um, some folks might look at Code for America and go, oh, those are the techies that make government work. Um, but the truth is what we are really doing at CFA is using the tools and language of technology to reimagine a government that actually sees and serves all of its people. And so with that heavy sense of responsibility, again, it's an honor to be with all of you on this call. Thank you, Amanda. And if, for the folks who are joining us and just joined us, we are in for an amazing, amazing experience. I'm already so inspired by all what's been shared so far. Um, and just understanding also how it, it is personal. And I think that that's one of the parts that I think it's gonna be very important to also have the marathon mindset as we go forward. And so now with Jose, how are you feeling this moment? And tell us a little bit more about yourself as well. Um, thank you. And uh, sorry, I was having some, I was having some uh, tech issues and going from one conversation to the other. It's uh, it's been overwhelming. I mean, I I just uh, I, I, I I tell people that you know, the past three months we've been working, folks at math, particularly working harder than ever before. And I think it's because the moment requires us to do, uh, as, you know, the most that we can do, uh, because you know the issues that are uh, they're impacting our communities are so overwhelming. And so yeah, so I feel um, overwhelmed. Um, I mean, I think you know we hear from clients on a daily basis. We're getting 
emails, uh, we're getting Facebook messages, we're getting send us, you know, tickets. I mean, we're getting calls, you know, a day in, day out of people, uh, you know, just, you know, their financial lives have been devastated. And, and, and that's what we do at MAF is to help people, help low income, you know, families, immigrants, particularly to build their financial uh, lives. And so to sort of see a lot of our work just sort of like evaporate, if you will, from one day to the next, one week to the next, is because of the of the crisis, of the pandemic, or just the lack of, you know, government help and support of our people. It's just it's just overwhelming. I mean, I, I just I don't know how else to say it. And, but 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 we're using that sort of sense of frustration really to, you know, uh, power our our efforts, you know, even more so, right? To not walk away from you know the work or not walk away from this moment, but to really try to figure out well, what else can we do? I mean, how can we use finance for good? How can we use tech for good? How can we do more, do different things so that that way we can, you know, step step in and and uh, and, and and provide some relief for people. And you know, this is something that you know I've, I've always been passionate of and trying to work with, you know, work and work for and advocate for immigrants. As an immigrant myself, you know, I know the struggles that people go through. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, this week. 40 years ago, we came to this country. I was a nine-year-old boy from Mexico. Uh, we walked across the U.S.-Mexico border in the dead of night on the 4th of July. You know, uh, you know, as a nine-year-old, I saw all the fireworks, you know, blazing in, in San Diego, and I thought it was like a welcoming committee. Okay, I didn't think that. It's, it's a funny joke that I tell myself, but, you know, but uh, every time I see the fireworks on the 4th of July, I actually remind myself of, of that, of that journey that I took, you know, as, as a, you know, as a, as a young kid, and also within our family. And 40 years later, you know, here I am. Uh, but, but not never forgetting the struggles, never forgetting where we come from, never forgetting that, you know, that the key components that made us survive and thrive as a family. And, 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 and that's what we try to espouse, you know, frankly, within math and everything that we do, you know, uh, in our work for support of, of immigrants and families alike. So. So, so I'm I'm always been driven by this issue, um, and then because of that, you know, in moments like this, you know, when our communities are not just in the front lines, but they're the ones being disproportionately impacted by, by the you know COVID crisis, and you know even health wise, I think you know with people like us in you know, in positions of leadership and you know being professionals, we have to do more, you know, and so so I'm 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 feeling that weight. Uh, and uh, but but every day we wake up and we have to sort of say, well, what else can we do? You know, because we cannot be, you know, we can't let, um, uh, you know, we can't we can't just let that, you know, what's happening go on and on, so uh, go unanswered, if you will. Yeah, definitely. So let me jump jump in here. Um, I'm finding this conversation very moving for two reasons. One, because um, I have a lot of anger myself at the extent to which we know from our experience in the community, but which the data also tells us, the extent to which as a community we're affected by the virus. Um, some numbers put out two weeks ago by the Brookings Institution found that we are, Latinos are more likely to get sick than other populations. And we know this, right? We, we could have told you this at the beginning of the pandemic that that would be true because we know we're overrepresented among essential workers. Um, and African-Americans and, and, and Latinos are also, um, dying at higher rates um, and sometimes by a factor of eight to ten compared to um, people who are white in our same age cohorts. Those are huge, huge disparities. Um, and it means that the policy decisions that are being made uh, by government at every level, um, you know, as usual, kind of disproportionately affect us, but in a way which is obviously very painful. And Jacqueline, you, you shared with us your you know, your grief and your loss, and thank you for your generosity in doing that. I, what I'm hearing from all of you, right, is that you're feeling um, personally affected, um, and at the same time, the need to kind of dust yourself off and make sure that you are bringing your best self to your work. Um, for the Latino Community Foundation, what does that mean in this moment? How are you focusing your work um, in this moment of crisis in the community? So you said dust off. I feel like I'm still crawling from underneath the weight of the moment. And to Jose's point, understanding that we're standing in front of a opportunity. And I know that's hard and I, that's why I had to share where I was coming from personally, because literally wiping the tears away in the morning just to kind of get started. 
but realizing that we're standing at a crossroads where the walls are caving in. Um, the policies as we've known it, we know they haven't worked. We've all been sounding the alarm that when a public health crisis like this will hit, it will hit the Black and Latino community the most because it's not gonna follow just a random pattern. It's gonna follow the patterns that we've created with the systems we've created. So we've all been sounding the alarm, now we're living it in the middle of a global pandemic. For us, it's just really heightened and raised the volume of the importance of our mission. I, unleashing the civic and economic power of Latinos. What does that look like in California? Well, 7.9 million eligible voters are Latinos here in the state of California, the largest voting bloc in the entire country here in the state of California. People will say, oh, California's not a blue state. Well, there are important elections happening in Fresno, Merced, and Bakersfield, and we're now beginning to see even the Fresno City Council, for example, Amanda, I know you appreciate, finally reflect the demographic of the region. Salinas is a place that is predominantly Latino, over 70%. When you look at city council, the leadership, it does not reflect the people. So the idea of changing what life will look like, the AC moment, the after coronavirus moment, will have to be one where Latinos and the Black community are overrepresented in making policies, overrepresented in government, because for far too long we have not been there. And when we come with our lived experiences to those spaces, we will create policies that make sense. We will create policies that can be executed in the real world. We will create policies and opportunities that will touch the lives of people. Thankful that I live in a state right now that is pretty progressive. Thankful that there are about $100 million set aside for small businesses. But are we also making sure that that money is being made available by not just banks, but also uh, CDFIs like um, uh, Inclusive Action in LA, which is a nonprofit organization that now has the capacity to provide capital to street vendors? Because by the way, they're making a living to support their family. So, are we widening the definition of what an entrepreneur looks like and then investing in them so that someone like Caridad Velasque, who's from Boyle Heights, who's selling tamales and pozole to keep her family fed, actually has the opportunity to access money to grow her business. Just, just like in 1987, when we celebrated baby boom, this woman who was making applesauce in her house and everybody's like, yeah, that's the American dream. When we think about entrepreneurs, we're not thinking about the street vendors and the women making arepas to sell, to keep their children Bed, right? So expanding the definition of that, having people in policy it, making positions that will make money and capital available to our communities when they need it, where they need it. And then on the, and that's me merging the civic and economic power, because it's not just about voting. We know we got to get our communities registered to vote and vote, but it's also how are we creating the pipelines of those individuals to run from office from a place of understanding where the real world, our world is coming from, right? And so, Cecilia, to answer your question, it's going on the offense, not just thinking about the defense of survival right now, which we are in. Um, just got off a bunch of calls with our staff talking about the organizations in Salinas who've been incredibly hit, not just the families they're serving, but their staff. So it is an issue of how do we support them to just even keep their heads up and above water right now, while at the same time understanding that there's a moment of us reimagining a new economy, reimagining a new democracy, a stronger democracy that's more reflective of who we are. And that's where the Latino Community Foundation sits, um, stands, I won't even say sit, where we stand and we're running towards to really just build that power here in the state of California. So great. Let me ask one more and then Lily, I'll hand back to you. Um, Amanda, I'm really familiar with Code for America's work. We're partners. Um, and you know, you described what was happening your first day. You also work a lot on making sure people can access the safety net, making sure people can access justice. What are you seeing in this moment that is relevant to what Code for America does and how you can make a difference? Yeah, so our approach at Code for America is really to partner with a lot of organizations that are out there, but we do the work. We actually deliver the services. Um, our, and, and one of the big pieces that we've been working on for a really long time is how do you build a strong social safety net? And the thing that a lot of people might not have thought very much about and all of a sudden find their, themselves a lot more in it, understanding that it's particularly important to our black and brown communities. Um, I want to share this story, which is for me, as I think about the Latino community, um, I think about our kids. 
not only because I have kids who are also in school, but when you think about the kids, 55% of our kids in school are Latino right now. When you think about that statistic across the country, it's almost not different. Of the nine largest um, cities, um, ten out of, nine out of the 10 largest cities, majority are Latinos. Um, place like Houston, it's, you know, in the 60s, even in a place like Boston that you might think of, not think much about, 42% of public school kids are Latino. This is the part that bugs me, though. Um, we at Code for America really read what's happening out there, and we try and drive it through the data. And here's a, here's a stat that we've focused on. About 16% of households with kids were reporting that children were not eating enough in the previous week. 29% of black households and 24% of Hispanic households reported that children were not eating enough, compared with 9% of white households. These levels are incredible, are insane and devastating. One of the things that we've been working on and what we, what we asked ourselves at Code for America is what can we do? Well, there's a program out there that's a pandemic EBT. And this is essentially creating cash assistance so that families can buy groceries, particularly families who are on school nutrition programs. This is important for two reasons. Number one, we have a lot of our kids in schools. Number two, it's one of the few programs that actually help immigrant families make sure that they have food on the table. Um, so we launched with the state of California, as well as with a number of other states across the country, 88% of states currently right now have pandemic EBT programs in place, and they're looking towards implementation. So Code for America is trying to partner with as many as we possibly can, because we know that based on our research over 10 years, we know how to build free and simple processes to reach our kids. Um, just as a matter of um, what we did here in California, within the first four hours of this program opening, 210,000 kids applied to get cash assistance for groceries. So when you wanna put some numbers on what is happening out there, that's what's happening. And so I share it with you because one of the things we all can do is we can get the word out about getcalfresh.org. We can get the word out about getyourrefund.org, which is our earned income tax credit, one of the biggest anti-poverty programs out there. And for the first time, Code for America developed a free and easy, simple app that you can go to, and for the first time ever, it's also in Spanish, with Spanish chat. And so to the extent that we all can do our part using the power and systems that we have, we've got to not only produce it, but then we got to tell each other. And so in comunidad, right? We talk about this. Let's get it out to our comadres. Let's get it out to our communities out there and say, listen, you know, here's a chance to be able to get the money that's owed to you in the earned income tax credit. Here's a chance to get your EBT card to make sure that food is on the table. And then third, we gotta start advocating like heck to policymakers because there's not enough of us sitting at that table. As the first Latino chief of staff in the history of the US Senate, there's definitely not enough. And so we've gotta be even louder for all those who aren't sitting at the table. Um, so thank you for, for allowing me to share that, Cecilia. And then, then out of uh, staying louder and building specifically the changes that we want to see, specifically building tech ecosystems in areas that are for many times have been forgotten. And so this question is for, for Irma. Given the role that, that you and the Bidway team have been doing in building tech ecosystems, and specifically in areas that are called underdark cities, right? Of what does that even mean? And so the question is, what, what role is Bidwise playing in the community? And specifically, what have been some of the additional key challenges that you've seen impacting the Latinx community and how Bidwise has been uh, taking leadership role in these? Yeah, that, well, Bitwise like, it is a complicated business, but it has a singular goal, which is to use the technology industry to change the face of who gets to work in that industry. Who are those resulting technologists and do they get to participate in this high growth, high wage industry in ways that change their lives? Um, and if you look at places like Fresno, where we're headquartered, Fresno, California, um, uh, this is a really, really challenged place, a really um, disadvantaged place in many ways, you could argue one of America's most broken cities. Um, and so the goal of Bitwise to bring technology or catalyze the technology industry in places like that in underdog cities that are similar um, and invite people to the technology industry who have never really received that invitation before. That is all we do. That is our singular mission. And in this time of, we're doing that well, I think, you know, pre-COVID, 
uh, and then COVID hit and you have to change everything about the way that you are operating, but you can't lose sight of that goal, right? Because I think what we are doing and what's incredibly, incredibly important is that the lower third, right? The folks who were in the hourly jobs before, the non-matriculating college students, the folks who are working, you know, three part-time jobs and still having to find childcare with a, a tia so they can make it to the fourth, right? Like the lower third of earners in places like this, in, in these underdog cities, those are the ones we need to be most concerned about as we begin to, you know, recover. And I use air quotes here because I don't think that we actually have a true recovery in sight at the moment. But let's just say, right, the rest of us, those of us on this panel, lots of the, the folks who are viewing, you think once this pandemic is over, you start to think about where am I going to vacation? Uh, uh, what's the first concert I'm going to see? Which restaurant am I going to eat at? You know, I mean, those are questions that we get to ask ourselves from a position of privilege, right? But there are, there's an entire set of my own community members and your own community members who are not asking themselves that question. It is how am I going to get out of this hole, right? How am I going to climb out of this hole that I didn't create, but is now in front of me? Uh, how, what are we going to do then? And so that is the question that Bitwise is concerning itself with, is what happens to those folks as we start to climb out of that? And can we do something about that today? Can we begin the path out of those holes today? And so we work a ton with um, uh, apprenticeships and we work a ton with uh, um, really reaching a more equitable technology industry. Amanda knows all about this, but the face of the technology industry, literally the face of the technology industry does not look like the people on this call, right? That is not what the technology industry looks like and we can change that. We can be deliberate in changing that and not by waiting for it to happen accidentally, but by setting up real things in place that reach those rural edges and sort of the inside of California, um, the second California, if you will, um, and then pathing folks into the technology industry using really deliberately constructed programs that take things into account like single parenthood, like lack of transportation, uh, uh, like bus tokens, like uh, mental and emotional uh, well-being, those types of things. Um, so that's what we are working on. We have a couple of initiatives out. Um, one hopefully you'll be hearing about uh, soon is called the Digital New Deal, but one you may have already heard about is onwardca.org, um, and that is a platform that we built uh, actually, in conjunction uh, with the Caper Center, um, specifically to match folks who are being furloughed in large numbers from hospitality industry and, and similar into jobs that were surge hiring, logistics, e-commerce, those types of things, right? So could you take folks who are, was, you know, someone who's formerly a barista uh, got laid off from their job and, and help them take those same customer service skills and put them into, say, like a call center job or a, um, a delivery job or something along those lines. And so we built a platform for that. It's called onwardca.org. But its specific focus is not just like this random jobs site where you can find your next you know, promotion um, so much as can we take that lower third of folks who are struggling to just stay even, right? Just to continue to tread water while the economy does what it's going to do and while this pandemic does what it's gonna do. Uh, and, and can we just hold steady for a while longer so that it's a little bit easier, just a little bit easier to climb our way out when we're done. And, and anybody that knows me, I think that, Irma, you hit on such a great point, which is part of my own lived journey as well of understanding the power that technology has in changing somebody's, like my, my life path, right? I was uh, an immigrant at six years old mm -hmm. and fast forward had to go through the same issues that you were mentioning. I grew up with a single parent. My mom didn't, we had, we got in a car accident actually the first month that we were in the U.S. and we had no transportation. Mm -hmm. So navigating some of those things and not even knowing like the language were, were really challenging. But fast forward, being able to now have been able to be an engineer and being able to see firsthand the power that technology can bring, especially when that's it's applied for good. That's you. I mean, your life story, my life story highlights exactly the, the issue, I think, especially in the underrepresented communities, in the black and brown communities, in that like your ability to succeed in the technology industry had literally nothing to do with whether or not you were smart enough to succeed in the technology industry. It was not about potential. It was not about ambition. It was about life circumstance and these hurdles that were sort of in your way that were non-technical barriers to entry that you had to figure out a way, you and your family had to figure out a way to navigate. Um, and we can be more deliberate about those solutions. It does not have to be left to chance. Um, 
And, and so, yes, that is, um, that's what Bitwise is, is about. And your life story is, is really um, the, the story of so many of us that, again, we can be intentional about creating new pathways into this industry. Definitely, definitely. And having a very strong uh, mom, I think, was the other part that, uh, you know, pushed, pushed along the way as well. So thank you. Thank you, Irma. This question is going to be for Jose and then um, Cecilia, I'll pass it on to you after this. Um, especially as we start to take a look at the importance that financial and um, in financial marketplace and capital has, right? Uh, Jose, what do you envision when you speak of a fair financial marketplace, specifically for what are very hardworking families and the role that the Mission Asset Fund has in this in accomplishing this vision? Um, you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, because the vision is really about being intentional of creating services, products, uh, creating programs, you know, with, uh, with our community in mind, you know, because, uh, you know, um, a lot of people talk about, you know, checking accounts, savings accounts, or, you know, technology products, this or that, you know, but, but to a large extent, you know, our community is really, you know, really like the secondary users of all those products and services. And by secondary users, I mean that those products are never built, you know, with, you know, with people like us in mind or the communities that we come from in mind. You know, we're always the second thought or the afterthought or the ones that we have to sort of pick up but trying to figure out how to how to make ourselves understand that product or service, you know, and um, and and and, and, when, and when that happens, there's always a disconnect, you know, that people are not using that product or not using that program, you know, you know, because it was never built with them in mind to begin with, right? So what we're trying to do is to say, look, we can actually use technology, we can actually use finance for good, but only if we build product and services to fit the realities of the people that we're serving. And so, so that's really been the premise of all of our work at MAP in terms of, you know, building credit building programs, building lending circles, building, you know, even right now in terms of what we're doing with the current pandemic, we built a whole rapid response fund, you know, to try to get people uh, immediate cash assistance of $500 grants, you know, directly to people. Uh, you know, we build that, you know, knowing that, you know, as, as, as you know, as, as uh, at home orders were uh, starting to get issued, you know, we knew that, you know, a lot of our community members, a lot of our clients, you know, we're not going to have, you know, income, then we're going to get paid, then we're going to be able to work. And we also knew that government was just not going to, then we're not going to step up. I mean, you know, I've been around the block a couple of times, you know, I knew that, you know, for undocumented immigrants that we're not going to get any funding from or support from the federal government. I mean, you know, thankfully, you know, the governor of California came through with some funding, you know, left $75 million to help, you know, with, uh, with some cash grants, you know, but even that wasn't enough, right? And so, so, so we, you know, lifted up a whole new product, you know, a whole new uh, grant uh, getting process to, uh, to help individuals uh, that were undocumented, the people that were not getting any help from the federal government. And then, and then we started to fundraise around that. And so in a span of, you know, several months, you know, actually, as, as of today, we've raised uh, close to $26 million uh, from philanthropy, from corporations, from individuals just going to our website and then just donating $25 here, $50 there. Uh, we've been able to sort of fundraise $26 million that we're, you know, turning around and giving that money to individuals and families, you know, that need it most. And so, so we're able to do that because we build technology with our clients in mind, you know, not them being a secondary users or, or afterthoughts, you know, to the products and policies and services that, you know, that mainstream society has, you know, and so, so that's what we're doing. So what we mean by fair is that, it's like, we want to be seen, we want to be heard, we want to be, you know, catered to, we want our issues to be relevant, our issues or, or, or challenges to be addressed, you know, and, and, and not be, again, just the afterthoughts of, 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 of services that are out there. Um, so, so that's, that's really what we do. And, and, and thankfully, because we have our own, you know, technology, our own platform, our own, you know, sort of ability to make that happen, you know, we don't have to ask permission to a bank or a credit union to do anything. We like, we need a product, we can create it, you know, you know, uh, you know, in, a, in the span of a day, and then we can, you know, sell, help support that and, and, and bring it to market, as they say, you know, right away. So, so having that ability, 
you know, has really uh, helped us, you know, to do this at the national level. So we're, you know, we're kind of grateful for that. But that's, that's what we mean by FAIR. It's just that we want to be seen in the space. So thank you. I just want to note that um, Autumn McDonald, my colleague, has been putting um, in the chat links to some of the things that you're hearing our panelists mention. So there's a link to onwardca.org. And you just heard uh, Jose talk about the Mission Asset Fund, that the, the money that they've been able to raise, because some, some of the folks who are participating are asking how they can help. So um, that link is also in the chat if you're interested. Um, you talked about, it's interesting, Jose, that you just talked about wanting to be seen. Um, I, I, as you know, somebody who's worked around policy for a long time, I feel that way too, that there's a degree to which um, uh, we're still, I mean, even in a place like California, that we're still more invisible than we should be given the extent to, our, to which we're in the population. I know that's true in national policy making. That's a fight that a lot of us have been fighting for a long time. So I'd like to ask really any of you to jump in, but maybe Amanda, starting with you, because you've worked in the US Senate, you've worked in politics at the national level. Now you're working in California, which is home for you. But what do you, what do policymakers miss? What do you wish they saw that they're not seeing right now? And then let me invite anybody else to jump in after Amanda. Um, God, where do I start? There's so much. Um, you know, I used to, I used to often say, I wish I can bring them to my hometown and walk around so they get to know us. Um, and I, and I've changed over the course of time where I believed that if they, if folks would just see the numbers, they would know that it really does matter to get education policy right for Latinos because it's a growing population or that the numbers for voting Right. This is the first year will be the largest racial minority voting in a presidential election. And if they just saw and if people just saw those numbers, they would then reach out to the communities where we are. I have changed over the course of my career where I now believe it is on us that the only way we are going to be visible is to make ourselves visible. Um, you heard today we've got to be who we are out loud. We got to lean in more. We got to do the work that Jacqueline does in all these communities in California to say, yes, we are part of what we do is help you with resources. But part of what you do as a part of that is you collectively stand up together, too, and say, I am here and this is what I need. So as I think about us as a community and what we need to be saying as loud as possible, as much as possible, is we are the largest now racial minority voting voting block. We are now the majority of our public school kids all across the country. We are now an economic engine for this country. Um, we have to, not only us as a responsibility, say it out loud, but then we have to start holding people accountable. So it does make a difference who our leaders are, who we're voting for, when they get elected, what are, they, what are we saying to them? And frankly, all of us as leaders ourselves, but also in our, in our circles of leaders in business and in all the different communities, how are we collectively doing our best to build a, vo a voice that people will listen to with actionable? And I say this again, and I know you and I, Cecilia, we've been in a lot of rooms that say, what can I do? And the truth is we also need to come up with very actionable, this is what we need from you government, this is what we need from you policymakers. And the more we can do that, the easier it is to hold everyone accountable. And I gotta tell you um, on this call, I am inspired because I know there's all kinds of folks, not only on this call, but are also listening in, that if we speak together, um, we can make a real difference here as we move into whatever is AC, as Jacqueline would say. Does anybody else want to jump in? Jacqueline? Yeah, I mean, everything, amen to everything Amanda just said. I mean, how many of us can change a room when we walk in because we know how to be loud? And this is our moment to be loud and be un unapologetic about what we're demanding. I am so inspired by Edma and Jose and what they're doing. And LCF wants to see more Latino-led anchor institutions like yours exist up and down the state because you know what it's like to be on the other side. You know what it means for our tias to actually know where to turn to to get that check when they hear it about it in Univision or Telemundo. Like we, we, we know, we understand because we're living it. And so we need more of those leaders to have the funding that they need to grow their organizations. And to the third sector that I'll add to Amanda, she mentioned the public sector. She mentioned 
mentioned um, I, I, the, the public one, because I'm with you on the scale level, like government, it's, it's the only place where we can work at scale. But the one that I want to add is the philanthropic community. 1.1% of all philanthropic dollars gets invested in Latino-led organizations. And Jose, to hear you say that 26 million, like, thank, like, I'm so grateful that you made the fund available and are using those funds to reinvest back in the families. But we need more of those philanthropic dollars to go into other Latino led organizations that have budgets of less than a million dollars, but are so connected, intricately intertwined into the communities that they serve, but they're not getting the resources that they need. So we need to change that. And that's why LCF changing this narrative is also important. Let's own it. So we have now the largest. Latino philanthropic network in the country because we were tired of pointing a finger to the philanthropy say invest 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 so we said to a bunch of Latinos here in California let's do this together let's pull our resources and invest in Latino led organizations and anyone can join you don't have to be Bill Gates in terms of the dollars that you have in your bank account if you are in a place where you have some privilege and have some discretionary funding and just have some resources available to pay it forward be part of a network that's 500 plus that's already investing a million plus into latino led organizations right like there are ways that we can shift this narrative that we haven't been at the table i'm so tired of hearing of where you know where's our martin luther king well i'm looking at them right now like we with their leaders all across our country who are latinos we don't we don't need to wait we're we're, we're them where we are them and so we just have to continue to be loud um, and unapologetic and demand the things that we want to see happen in our community and not stop until we get it. You know, I think it's so that's tremendously important and so powerful. And it is also powerful and moving that we're doing this in a, we're lifting up what we're seeing in our community, but we're also doing it in a non-competitive way that we're doing it in a supportive way at this moment in which the country is also focused on our history of systemic racism and racial violence and particularly focusing on the African-American community. Like all of this is connected and we, we understand that it's connected and we are in a place where we, we're, it's clear that we have to lift, lift up all the voices that have been left behind with respect to the virus, with respect to the economic fallout. Um, that is something that feels like has changed over the course of the, you know, the 30 years I've been doing this work is that we understand this is not fighting over pieces of the pie. This is about understanding how much we are connected and how much our struggle is, is you know, also the struggle of other communities. But with that, I have a question for Irma and then Lily, I'm gonna hand back to you. So Irma, you do work in place. You, you have a place-based component to what Bitwise Industries does. And you, you're, you are recruiting people for tech work in places that people don't necessarily associate with the tech industry, right? You are giving the lie to the notion <laughs> that only certain kinds of people can do this work and only certain kinds of places can sustain it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think in the seeds of what you're doing are the seeds of how we recover in a, to, in, and build a more, we, we don't, we're not just trying to get back to where we were because that economy wasn't working for enough people. We were trying to build a different kind of economy and, and the seeds of what you're doing, I think are, are, are showing what, how that's possible. For sure. I think, well, if you think about technology as a tool and stop, let's demystify this for a second and, and disabuse your, abuse yourself of the notion that you have to have gone to MIT or Stanford in order to succeed in the technology industry. It simply isn't the case. Um, think about this moment in time that we're in where everybody is trying to go online and trying to modernize, you know, systems that we have sort of been ignoring for a couple of decades, you know, uh, whether that is the unemployment insurance system or that is uh, remote and digital learning or if it, it, or even it could be the shoe cleaning business down the road, right? And the ability to drop off and pick up things in a safe way. All of the things in this new society that we expect to live in, in the near term, starting now, um, they're all digitally powered. They're all powered by software and the ability for technology to take the place of things that uh, um, uh, would be considered unsafe at the moment. Think about the way that you pick up your food right now. Yes, some people are still going to the grocery store, but by and large, lots of people are, are uh, we're creating jobs and having that food delivered, but we are, the way that that transaction takes place is over a piece of software. And so a gigantic piece of this new economy will be powered by technology. It was already the fastest growing industry on the planet. The pandemic, like it has done for so many things, has just accelerated that, right? Um, and so now we're in this place where 
it, and you probably have heard this phrase that that technology is the new blue collar work. And in some ways, that's very, very true. You can teach. We, we don't gate for for um, any specific um, ability when we when a person takes our classes. We ask for three things that uh, uh, actually two things now, but we used to ask for three things that you can read and write in English, that you can divide by three um, and that you have an ardent interest in learning how to write code. That's it. We've, we've, got, we've done away with the first one, which is you no longer have to read and write in English. We now do uh, uh, classes in Spanish uh, and in Hmong and in uh, a couple of other languages. So being able to reach more people with that technology education. But the point here is that you can, you can take somebody who has an interest in technology and skill them into entry level work in a period of months. We're not talking about years. We're talking about months from something between six and 18 months. We typically will see somebody get ready for entry level work. That has a lot to do, of course, with practice and uh, cultural and familial support and, and those types of things uh, where you do in fact have to have a family support system or even a chosen family support system that doesn't believe that just because you're on a laptop means you're playing games, you could very well be looking for your next job. We do have to change that sort of in the home. That's a different uh, conversation. But what we see is that it's not related to race. It's not related to gender. It's not related to last name. It's certainly not related to whether or not your parents went to college. Um, your ability to enter into the technology, in, in technology industry has to do with whether or not you have the time and the resources to put in the practice. And that's it. Um, so if we can reach these underdog cities where we know that the technology industry is that future, that is the way out of the, the uh, economic crisis that we're in, um, in these underdog cities, if we can get more people to skill into the technology industry, the, real, the only real thing we have to solve for is how do we block and tackle for them long enough to practice? And that's it. It's not, <laughs> my business is not, it's a complicated one because there are a lot of fronts on which you have to block and tackle but it's not a complicated one in terms of what, what makes it go, right? What is the, what's the, the fuel here? What's the power? We're just, we're just moving, kicking rocks out of the path so somebody can walk. Um, and that, if we do that enough times, you know, th this, and this has been studied, this is not a number that we came up with, but for every technology job you create, 4.3 additional jobs and local goods are also created. So, Here's the net econo economic impact. If you can get one person to skill into the technology industry, if you can just block and tackle for that one person long enough, they change their lives, they change that of their family, 90% of them will stay in the place in which they were trained. So they're likely to stay home, They'll, they're likely to stay in those communities and you've created four additional jobs. So now for the price of just helping somebody study, you've got five new jobs in that local economy. That's more sandwiches, that's more coffees, that's more ga uh, uh, gas in the tank, that's more times rent is paid on time, uh, that's more times you're not trading PG&E for groceries, right? Um, and so if you can, and again, I, I, I hate to minimize the, the breadth of what my company does to this one thing, but that's all we're doing. We're just giving people a shot to try to be good at something. Um, and in this case, that something is technology. And in this case, that can change an entire community if you just do it a couple of hundred times. And I would say change generations. Like it's all about building that generational knowledge and wealth and opportunity. In my, I, I just, as you were talking, I think that one out of three ch Latino children right now live in households of, of families whose sectors are gonna disappear, retail service as we know it. Um, and so it's not just the impact right here and now, but those children where they're growing up and what they're giving access to right now. It's about generational change. And that's what I love so much about the work of. Thank you. Yeah, completely agree. I mean, Lilia, I mean, she can tell her story <laughs> herself, but I mean, the life of her, her family and everyone she knows forever and always will now be changed because of the experience that she had in the technology industry. And definitely and on that note, one of the, the areas that I've been also looking at is it's kind of crazy that we're still talking about a digital divide in 2020, right? So like I was just remember when I was a kid being in college back at USC, we had Wi-Fi for across the campuses and a lot of the, where I used to volunteer, which families that look like mine, right? When I was in college, it, to me, it was like, oh, it's like Wi-Fi is everywhere. And when we realized what happened with COVID, with, with it being overnight, we're now digital first. Yet, um, we have more families disconnected, literally from resources, information that could save their lives, 
And it's so crazy that when you start, start to take a look at the map, the data just shows how systematic it's been by incomes, by income level, by zip codes. And so it's one of those things that I think is super critical to also take a look at of how is that reshaping into your point um, earlier that was brought up about the intergenerational changes. This is something that I think I'm is super passionate. I'm going to get off the soapbox because I can go on for that long. But I, taking it a, a step further from the students, the talent, the individual experience, I want to also just uh, move it towards the small business impact. So this question is for Jose, specifically where you've been at and looking at the economic impact that our small businesses have, have had of all different ranges, whether they were either not, not having a technical platform, but they've been forced to rethink how they're existing in this world and how to pivot with a little bit more of the tech lens. What are some particular solutions that maybe you've seen or would like to explore to help meet some of these families who were ca caught in a place where they weren't ready, where a lot of these businesses got caught in a place again that they weren't ready? What are some of those, those uh, solutions that you see specifically to help close some of these gaps of income uh, that is not being gained? Um, so I don't know if you have a, a, yeah. some, some specific solutions that you've been exploring. Um, well, you know, our clients, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just sort of witnessing what they do and try to help as much as, uh, as much as we can. But, you know, but I, I think, you know, we talk about small businesses and, you know, that word means a lot of different things depending on what context and depending on what agency you're talking about. Uh, I mean, the way we, we think about the clients that we serve is that they really are operating what I call like nano businesses, you know, really tiny, or, you know, uh, you know, organizations that might be comprised by one or two or three individuals. I mean, small businesses, you know, at the federal level there, I think this is defined by no more than 500 employees. Is that, is that the right number? 500? Cecilia, I don't know if you remember that. Uh, anyway, but it's, you know, uh, for an immigrant to have 500 employees, that, that, that's like making a big time. You know, that's that, that to me would be a huge business. But so we, you know, essentially have to help, you know, uh, folks again that, that are just working for themselves or their families operating them. And what we've seen, you know, even in the current pandemic and the crisis is that, you know, people are really resilient, you know, uh, and, and, and yes, you know, people are taking a lot of hits, you know, yes, their, you know, their restaurants or their offices you know, have been, you know, closed and yes, they are losing income, you know, but, uh, you know, I'm getting, you know, food delivered by different, you know, mom and shop up and shop folks that are cooking at their homes now. You know, people that used to work at different restaurants now are, you know, are rebuilding, you know, their, their sort of operation from, from their homes and then they're trying to find, you know, uh, clients like that. And so, so I think what we need to do is to kind of find, you know, those strategies and support them, to support people where they are, not where we want them to be or where we think they should be, right? And, and I think that's one, that's one of our values and principles and everything that we do at now is meet people where they are, not where we, where we think they should be. And then from that, it can elevate, you know, their strategies, their coping strategies, their, the things that they're already doing to kind of, you know, survive and say, yes, yeah, survive. And then after that, you can, you know, help elevate and help move forward, right? Uh, but so, so that's sort of like a strategy. Now, what we do at MAP is, is do that and also provide them with resources, financial resources, zero, in, zero fee uh, loans, grants, we provide them, you know, our ability to, you know, participate in lending circles so that that way they can improve their credit score and and also their ability to kind of access, you know, a low cost credit as well. But I, but I think, you know, to me, you know, the most fundamental thing, and I would love, love to sort of interject this in this conversation, is that, you know, you know, this is a really unique moment in time, you know, that we have, you know, America is really transforming itself right before our eyes. And I think the question is like, you know, what do we want this to be, to become, to, you know, and, and I think this is where we, you know, as, as was said earlier, we have to sort of show up and not be invisible anymore and really be loud. But not just be loud to say like, oh, it's our turn, it's our turn because we have more people than everybody else. It's not that. It's about, we have something even more important to share to the world. And that is our, our values, our systems, the way we've managed to maintain and relate with our families and communities, because I think that's something that is, you know, is important, you know, for America to remind itself, you know, that we're not just this, you know, you know, individualistic, you know, you know, society, but it's more like we need to kind of go back to, you know, the, the you know, that the family structure that 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 has allowed many of us to actually survive, and 
And I, and I think it's those values and those principles that we need to kind of put out there in a really loud way. You know, because that I, I, that, I think, is what can transform the policy conversations, you know, at, you know, at the state level or also at the federal level. Because it's not just that, it's, it's not just a question of as it's our turn or, or, or to do that, but it's more about we need to kind of help reimagine what the society could be so that it could be truly you know, inclusive, you know, and truly uh, equitable for all. And, and, and I think that that's, that's the moment that I think is there, you know, and I think is, 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 is something for us to sort of like, you know, step into and really do more with it than just, you know, uh, you know do our current normal day-to-day -day work. So we have, so that's very helpful, um, enormously helpful. And just speaking of getting loud, I will just report that there's a big thunderstorm. I'm in the DC area, so so I may make real use of the mute button as it gets loud here. But we have a bunch of questions that people are submitting, and I'm noticing that there are folks in the chat, and some of them are sending chats just to the panelists, which means the rest of the attendees can't see them. So if you're adding things to the chat, which we totally welcome, be sure to make sure that they're going to other attendees. And we have some questions that, um, that have come in Here's one um, that relates to uh, Latinx businesses from Regina Moreno Hernandez, who wants to know how we get Latinx businesses on board when it comes to technology and social media. So let me just throw that out to the panel and see who, who wants to respond. Anybody? I'll jump in. I mean, this is related to a new initiative that we launched in May. It's a Latino Entrepreneurship Fund, and it's not just about providing seed capital or just money to uh, to what Jose said. These are micro, nano businesses. These are uh, folks that are actually starting them at home, right? Whether it's a cleaning business that started with three women who came to this country together are now owning that business, right? Cooperatives. Um, but it's also about giving them the tools uh, to be able to digitize their marketing, their outreach. And so we're partnering with groups like the Eva Longoria Foundation, who's done this with some young entrepreneurs, um, working with Prospera Cooperative. I see your beautiful daughter behind you, I think. <laughs> she just popped out of the beach, by the way. I love it. <laughs> Um, but Prospera Cooperative, who's actually based out of the Bay Area, but they actually have created a community of women who are immigrants and who have launched their businesses and they're giving them a space to learn about digitizing their marketing, about creating podcasts to actually reach a wider audience about their work and to lead their businesses. Jose, to your point, that was the most important thing that I hope everyone can take away from the audience is lead with our values. Like we don't need more of the same. What makes us like as a people so special is that we want to pay it forward, that this isn't just about me, that it is about community and neighborhood and family. And when we bring those values and how we build our, our businesses, um, we can change the game and change the rules. So I just want to share that because that entrepreneurship fund is now recently established, uh, working with groups like Prospera, uh, working with groups like Eva Longoria. And I've seen my staff on the, on the chat room, so maybe they can just share that information with the wider audience. And we need more of that, especially right now where, again, um, outreach looks very different and uh, our businesses need to be able to tap into those resources. In I don't know if there's something that you can share maybe through the work that you're doing at Bitwise with some of the entrepreneurs that you house. Yeah, I think, I, I think uh, the biggest thing is demystifying, I think, it, which is uh, central to your message as well. Um, I think a lot of folks who are running, especially on the small business side, feel that technology is out of reach for them um, and that it's a, a giant six or seven figure lift in order to be modernized in sort of a technology sense. Um, it's not, it's, it, it is sometimes true, absolutely. Um, but in many cases, especially if you're running, uh, you know, a taqueria or something and you're looking for a mobile ordering app, you don't have to go spend you know, five, six, seven figures to get your, your own app done. You can, there are lots of resources for, you know, for, for small businesses to, to be modernized in that way. And it's a matter, I think, of asking folks like yourself, myself, Amanda, um, Lily, the other folks on the call, I'm a small business and this is my specific need. Are there options for me? Um, uh, and demystifying the, or, or sort of disabusing ourselves once again of the notion that you've got to have 
uh, something specific in order to use the same tools that other other people are using. Um, and we can help with that. Like we can answer those questions in a way that's non-threatening, that is not like, oh, I can't believe you didn't know that. You know what I mean? Like, and let's let's get, let's get it done. There are lots of free and low cost tools, I think, to get started with uh, when uh, when you're a small business. And I think that that's where most of it is fear based uh, in terms of getting more Latino owned businesses uh, into technology. So let me just say to Gladys Jimenez, who asked the question about how to support uh, other Latino businesses, to check the chat because there are now links for you that can help you do that. And then now let me pass the baton back to Lili. Thank you, thank you. Um, and going off on that question, and this is for Amanda, because one of the, the questions that came in from the audience as well is specifically around kind of like the Code for America model of how do, how do you build and invest in the communities, right, at a, at a national scale. So I wonder, um, if you can share a little bit more of that, especially as we're relating to technology, right? And the, the intersection of our communities who are a lot of the times depending on some of these opportunities where they're welcome in to leverage the technology, especially around social services. So if you can share a little bit more about for some of the folks, specifically this question is from Eric Rens Whitmore um, of how to build and invest national communities uh, that have a very grassroots feel as well. Yep. So one of the things that um, is really special and unique about Code for America is that we have been around for 10 years and we really started off with this idea that we wanted to get um, technologists into government so that they would bring a new talent to the way we deliver services today. Um, along with that, there was an energy that also grew around volunteers that work all across the country in what's called our brigades, 25,000 brigade, brigades across the country. Um, and what these, like for instance, Code for San Jose or Code for Miami, and what these groups are doing is in their free time, they're using their technology services or as a group coming together and they'll food map, for instance. Um, they do a lot of free translation. They're sometimes the chat. If you go in and you do the EITC program in Spanish and and you have, a, and you have a question, that chat could come back to you in Spanish and it's a volunteer all across our network. The really interesting thing about that is what we're finding in, the, in our code, what we call our brigade network or Code for America network, um, is it is also an opportunity for young people who are sitting at home, have this talent to get involved in the community in a way where they can use their talents to connect with city services. And for us, what we have seen around the country is it's one of the best ways um, for because what you know about what's happening in your community, you know where you live, you know what is needed, you know sometimes that bus route, you just like to have a service to know when it's going to be there. And a lot of our Code for America brigades are the folks who have teamed up, not only in their national day of hacking, but teamed up in their communities to say, let's build this app. And let's build this app to serve who we are and where we are. Um, as I think about all the folks who are listening to this conversation and really the power of tech, as Irma has said, is the door is open. We are recreating it as we live today. Our kids are getting online and learning how to do this. And as we think about technology and as we think about technology's relationship with government, the more engagement you have, whether it's at Code for America or whether it's in Irma Shop or whether it's you are in government now, Having a new lens to say, let's do it this way. A very good example, um, and I could go on all day about the things that we are learning that technolo technology has surfaced. In some of our government programs, if you have an accent in your name, you get kicked out of the system. In some of our systems, if you're trying to do an application, it times out on you. And I gotta tell you, as a, as a parent at home with kids and you walk away because your kid is hungry, all of a sudden you come back and the application you did is gone. And so that's the power of technology. But like Irma was saying, we all can do this now. And um, I do have to say, Code for America, we're always out there with um, job postings. Please apply. We need your voices. We need your skills within the organization. Um, you, you, I, I keep saying this over and over again. Um, if you want a tech job, let, let us help you because we need more of your voices and faces in this space. And I saw that our Latinx and um, community members such as Tequiri and Latinas in Tech are sh widely sharing those opportunities at Code for America. So it's really great to see all of us really sharing those opportunities as an ecosystem. Um, I'll hand it back to you, Cecilia. Okay, so we have a question from Marlene Castro for Irma about some of the emerging technologies. She talks about how um, sometimes our kids tend to fall further behind within our educational systems when we're just getting started with coding. 
more and more new tech like augmented reality, virtual reality, machine learning, AI, like how do we break through into some of these more emerging technologies? I'll tell you the truth, in technology, it doesn't matter what your background is, you're going to fall behind. <laughs> it changes so quickly and we come out with new languages and new platforms and new things to learn on a regular basis that, uh, um, uh, that you, from day one, regardless of what door you enter into, you will be in a maze of technology as long as you're in that career. Um, and so my advice to folks who are experiencing that on day one is to pick, pick a technology, something that in general is getting a lot of attention uh, um, and specialize uh, if you can. There are some sort of staples that you can, that you can sort of get into, into uh, in technology. Um, it's not really almost ever going to be a language um, or a piece of hardware that you specialize in so much as a technique. Um, and so, you know, you might learn, and this is actually something that I know that traditional education uh, institutions struggle with, call it, especially at the collegiate level, in that you'll learn a programming language um, that is obsolete by the time you walk out of those doors. Um, and I know that the colleges struggle with that, but the truth is in technology, you've already learned those foundational pieces that you can translate that now to another language that's more modern. Um, and so spend your nights and weekends, spend your summer, go get a, a, an apprenticeship or an internship that's going to reskill you into another language. But think of technology less as a, um, a, a straight path and more as a set of building blocks that you're going to pull from for the rest of your life. So that's, I, that's so powerful and so important. I will say that New America does work um, that's sort of like a cousin to what Code for America is doing and trying to get technologists into government, into NGOs, to kind of bring those skill sets into delivering what it is we try to deliver for people. And I, I find that part of the obstacles when you start talking about tech, people think they, 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 they think it means kind of building the app that's going to save America. And what we actually mean is exactly what you just described, right, which is bringing a set of skills to problem solving, to solving our public problems, to solving community problems, and to also bring your knowledge of the community, which is something that the tech sector doesn't necessarily provide. Like they don't have magical skill sets that are gonna solve our community's problems. We have the magical skill sets that can solve our community's problems. And sometimes mm -hmm. the answers are not technological answers. Some the answers are often just about problem solving. Mm -hmm. and, and Jose, to turn to you, I mean, essentially, when I was first, I mean, you and I worked together when you were in DC, when you were working in organizing. Um, but as I understand it, part of the insight that led to your, your founding of, uh, of your organization had to do with the understanding that in the community, we already had the capacity to solve some of our financial problems, even from, from oh. our modest means. And that sometimes the answers are not tech, sometimes the answers are community answers, right? That's that's exactly right, and thanks for bringing me back to that because I, I you know, um, I think the way I sort of see it is that you know, in, in our society, we think of you know, poor people are just being broken or being lazy or they they don't know enough, but they just need somebody to come and save them, and you know, pobrecitos, right? Because they're just you know there, and and then they become ob, ob, you know our objects to help and to solve, you know. But uh, and I think that's you know that's the vision of society, you know, right? That's something that we you know we all have to contend with. And in from that vision, we build products and services and policies, you know, with that misconception of people. And so I've always pushed back on that because again, you know, I came from, you know, an immigrant worked on the flea markets in San Jose, you know, and always hustling to make ends meet. And I knew that, that that's a different reality, you know, of people than the reality that we espouse, you know, in, in the policy circles, you know, because the reality that I knew was the people that were hard workers, people that are struggling, yes. You know, but, they, but that didn't diminish their dignity any, any less. And they were coming up with really ingenious solutions to navigate, you know, their lives in general. And so that's when we sort of lifted up this idea of, of lending circles that is already based on this, you know, age old tradition of people coming together and lending and saving money with one another. And so for us, we say like, you know, yes, continue to do that because what they're doing is something, you know, really important, which is like, they're lending money just based on, on, on their trust, on their social capital, on the relationships they have with one another. So instead of saying like, oh, forget about that, that's not how we do it in America, we said actually keep doing that. And then we're gonna bring technology to help and make it even better 
make it easier, make it more efficient, so that we can you know, translate it and report it to the credit bureaus. So for us, technology was not this you know, end all solution. It was just a thing that we had to use in order to you know, change the world. You know, because nowadays I tell people, it's like, yeah, you want to do anything in the world, you have to use technology. It's not, you know, it's like, you know, you're like a fish, you know, you're like, you know, it's, it's just, it, you're like in the water. That's technology nowadays. So that, to me, that's not an issue. Now, it was an issue with funders, right? Because funders, the foundations, they don't like to fund technology because they think they're, you know, we're taking the money to buy like, you know, fax machines or I don't know what they think what we're doing. But we said to us, technology, is programs technology investing in technology is investing in our in a programmatic you know uh, ability to deliver services and so they're one in the same they're not separate things they're not separate by line, budget items they're exactly the same thing because nowadays how can you not use technology right and so and so to me it was that wasn't the issue but i think what was most important was about having the vision to see the solutions that were already embedded in society and community and the families that we're helping with. And then we bring something to that so that that way we can elevate, the, elevate it and help them even more. And so, and I, and I think that's why I wanna underline the notion of, you know, of values and, and love and connection with one another because, you know, I think in a society we've been so, so disconnected from one another. I mean, we're actually forced to, you know, to like not even have a sense of community, sense of, togetherness right because that's just the notion or the drive of this you know this the system that we build but i think this is the moment that we can actually challenge that and say no we need to do it in a completely different way in a way that is more human that is more you know uh you know family like and so that way we can use technology to help that vision in, in, instead of the other thing so i think on that end and i'm also looking at the time um I think, thank you all so much for sharing so much information, so much data. I think we have hopefully been loud so for everybody that's that's listening. Um, but I also wanna go, go back, of how do we go from here with the same urgency that we started? Because we don't want this to just be a conversation. We wanna make sure that this is leading to action. And so what is your specific call to action? And this is an open question and I'll start with Jacqueline. What is the, what is the, the call to action that you wanna see us take from today? Well, I mean, everything has been said already. I just want amplifying it to hear that Jose again. I'm going to go back to the 26 million fund that you raised. I think about Totic and the Inland Empire is also being used as a vehicle to give the state dollars, so 75 million from the governor to families, Chila in LA. Like, we need those organizations to not just be in a moment of crisis, a place that the governor goes to to distribute those funds, but how do we also use that infrastructure, those relationships, that institution that people trust and they go to as the avenue to create opportunities for wealth, as an avenue to create opportunities to get licensed for new automated jobs. But we need to support these nonprofits, just like we need to support all the entrepreneurs that Jose was talking about, about this, the problem solving that they bring to the table, but we need capital to invest in them and their ideas and take risk and know that maybe one out of 10 ideas are the ones that are going to actually become something. So the call to action to the audience who's listening is let's invest in these leaders because they are risk takers. They know the community. They tr the communities trust them. The ingenuity, the word, just it, 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 we as daughters and sons of immigrants, like we know that word. We know how to create something out of nothing right and we know how to recreate every time crisis hits and get back up again and that's what this country is supposed to be all about so why are we not investing it at the scale that we need it so desperately right now so that and vote and fill out the census is my call to action at this moment <laughs> that's right who wants to jump in i'll jump in um I think there are unique moments in time that shape um, our country's history. And we have two of them right now. Um, one is the census. You really are, we, it is whether or not we will be counted, period, is dependent on what happens in the census right now. And it will shape decades, um, not just this next decade, but it will ge shape generations of how programs get set. Um, the second um, is we have a presidential election. 
We have a president election, presidential election at a time when we are the biggest racial minority voting. It is our moment to show up. And the question is gonna be, as we reach the end of the year, Latinos had an opportunity to have a voice. Did we do it or did we not do it? And it will be seen, again, not just at the end of the year, but it will be seen for decades to come whether we showed up this year. And there is no doubt to me, having been in public service and in politics and in the 2016 presidential election, that it is a very unique test for all of us in our community to make sure that it's this year that we have to be seen, we have to be counted, and we have to vote because it will shape the future for our kids. Thank you, Amanda. You gave me the chills right there, definitely. Irma? I, I have to echo the sentiment. In, in the beginning, we said it's never, there's never been a more important time to be you and to do that loudly. And that does mean the census. And that does mean get out there and vote. And that does mean amplify small businesses that are uh, Latino-led. Um, I think the i think we have untapped potential and power economic power as well like you everyone here knows somebody who's having a piece of software built right send them to one of these organizations to get that done right like go to a place where you know that that organization is deliberately looking behind us and saying who can we bring along who can we bring with us to this new moment um spend your dollars there Spend your dollars on the folks who are doing things in such a way that invest in our specific future. And I think that when we collectively look at all of the decisions that we make in a day, where we buy from, um, who we contract with to do X, uh, whether or not we have an uncle or not who uh, is, is also having a piece of software built or is also sending a kid to school or, or what have you, think about how we make those decisions. Uh, think about how you specifically make those decisions and then think about if there's a different way to do that, such that your dollar is stretched and it goes twice as far as you thought that it might. Um, that would be my call to action is look at where you're spending those dollars and whether or not you can make them go further. Okay, great. We'll go to Jose and then I will hand it over to Cecilia for the closing, closing thoughts on all of this amazing, amazing dialogue. Yeah, I, mean, I, I would echo everything that was said, um, you know, and, I, and I think it, it has to be under, understood that uh, we can do all that. We can, you know, show up and be counted and participate and, and be heard. Uh, you know, I think when, when we feel like that we that we belong in this country, you know, when we feel that we matter in this country, because once we feel those things individually as a community and society, then all those the other, all, the, all the other elements will follow that. And I think for 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 years and you know decades we have been we have been made to feel that we don't belong, that we don't matter, that we deserve to be separated, that we deserve to be, you know, uh, victimized and, and scapegoated. And so, and I think we need to sort of tackle that because it's not about the lack of power or the lack of ability or the lack of imagination from us as individuals as a community. It's just that we're made to feel like we don't even belong in this country. So I think as, as leaders, we have to sort of tackle that and say, no, aquí estamos y no nos vamos because this is our country. And you know, the country, and, and we're building the future, we're building in, in an America that will truly be inclusive you know, of everyone, including ourselves, including everybody. So I, th I think that's really, to me, that's a really important sentiment to put out there because uh, it's not just a lack of, uh, you know, for the lack of uh, people not participating, it's just because they just don't feel like they even you know, they're even seen. And so, you know, and I think, you know, once we do that, then we can build, you know, our, our campaigns and products and services and software, you know, based on them. You know, they're the primary users of the things. And instead of being, again, you know, uh, being secondary users of the things that are being built in, you know, in society right now. And so I, 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 would, I would say that as a call to action. You know, let's be uh, proud to who we are and make sure that we're creating the spaces and feelings of making us feel like we belong and that America belongs to us as well. So we're seeing people write in the comments how inspired they are by this panel, by the work that you do. Um, we have one that's been written to the panelists from Jorge Reyes Moreno saying you are all in your role for a reason. I will say, I, you know, I've been working in Latino policy and politics for more than 30 years and for so long 
the kind of argument that we were making is that we need to have, right, we need to be raising our own voices. We need to be leaders of organizations. We need to be leaders of foundations. We need to be leaders of companies. We need to be not just leaders of community institutions, although that's important. We need to be leaders of national institutions. Um, and we have each of those kinds of leaders right here on this panel, um, stepping up at a time when, you know, as a community, we're also, and as individuals, we're feeling some, some pain. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that, um, express real appreciation, not just that you participated in this session with New America and with New America California in particular, but for the work that you do every day and for um, the way that you're standing up for community, but also for country. Um, so it, it's, it's really important in these times right now to find sources of hope, to find sources of strength. You are, you are providing that. Um, I had a colleague say to me today, these are times in which you have to find and bring your very best self. Um, and, and that's what I'm saying on this panel. So really, thank you so much for co-hosting this, for co-moderating this with me, a two Boliviana moderated panel. Um, thank you to Amanda and Jose and Jacqueline and Irma. Thank you to Autumn McDonald, my truly wonderful colleague at New America, California, and to all the folks who participated. Um, we have a lot to do, um, but we should never doubt our capacity to do it. So thank you all so, so much, and we'll see you next time.